I grew up in Crown Heights in the late 50s, early 60s. It was a very um, multicultural community. There was every form of chassid and there was every from every form of observant Jew and there was a largest conservative temple in uh, all of New York. It was a very mixed community. But 770 Eastern Parkway was a rare and unusual address. Because at that time, the Jewish community were mostly immigrants having escaped Europe and were very pessimistic. It was a very dark mood because they were certain that Judaism would not thrive in America. In fact, they were certain that they were the last observant generation. After 3,300 years of observance, they were going to be the last, and they're going to watch it disappear. So it was a very disheartened community, very pessimistic. The future, everyone agreed, was going to be secular. With every year, fewer and fewer people would be observant. The yeshivas were not going to last. And that in America, Judaism, religion, was not going to blossom. The one exception was this building on Eastern Parkway, 770 Eastern Parkway. There was such an enthusiasm. There was so much singing. There was so much activity. It was alive day and night. And naturally, as a teenager or even a preteen, it was very attractive. You know, we got to stay up late <laughs> because there was a fabringen going on and because there was a, a an important class being taught or there's some project we needed to work on. And then I discovered that behind it all was the Rebbe. The Rebbe was absolutely enthusiastic about America. One famous writer, Herman Wouk, mentioned to the Rebbe back in the 50s, you know this is not Europe. You can't tell Americans to do anything. And the Rebbe said, correct. But in America, if you teach people, they can do everything. So the freedom that others saw as a threat to Judaism, because, you know, you can't tell anybody to do anything, the Rebbe saw that as a blessing. In the freedom of America, if you inspire someone, there's nothing they can't do. They can change their life. They can change path. They can affect others. So there was a freedom that would make Judaism richer than it was in Europe. And then there was something about the American mentality. On the one hand, the American was uncomplicated. Americans didn't have to scheme to survive like we, we had to do in Europe. Everything was a scheme that you could never tell people your real age. You always had false papers because it was dangerous to be at this place at this time and so on. So life was all a bunch of schemes. You couldn't trust anybody. You couldn't rely on anybody. It was, it was a tortured frame of mind. The simplicity of life in America allowed people to relax and breathe. You didn't have to scheme. 
you could tell your real birthday and I wouldn't do any harm. And that simplicity is a perfect um, frugal, uh, a ground, a soil that would nurture Judaism much better than any place else in the world. Secondly, Americans felt cosmopolitan. America was at the top of the world. Americans can go anywhere in the world and be proud as Americans. So they had a more global view. They thought big. Vast improvement over a shtetl mentality where you couldn't think past the ghetto walls. So for all of these reasons, the Rebbe was exceptionally optimistic and enthusiastic about the future of Judaism in America. And in fact, like uh, somebody said, the future is not what it used to be. Meaning, the prediction for the future that used to be was that with every generation there would be less and less Judaism, less and less religion, more and more secular. But that future has changed. We now see the future as more godliness, more mitzvahs, more observance. Every family has at least one bal tshuva. So the tide has turned. And that is due to one man, to the Rebbe. I also remember my family, my parents and grandparents, were not Chabad. And some of the activities that uh, the Rebbe in, instituted or introduced were not traditional. Like standing in the street and asking people to put on tefillin. That was not traditional. And so there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of resistance. Is this a good idea? We've never done this before. What's going to happen to kids standing out in the streets talking to strangers? Are they going to influence people to put on tefillin? Or are they going to be influenced by the people who refuse to put on film. It was, it was a serious concern. The whole idea of reaching out to non-observant Jews seemed like a very risky business. And the entire Orthodox world was against it. Forty years later, there isn't a Jewish organization or a Jewish movement or even a Hasidic movement that doesn't have outreach. Because if you don't do outreach, you don't even count anymore. It's the thing to do. But for 40 years, people resisted it. And the Rebbe was the only one. So let's take a look at what it's like when you stand out on the street and you ask someone to put on film. Imagine a little bar mitzvah boy standing on the streets of Manhattan. He approaches a man and says, excuse me, are you Jewish? The man says, yes. The boy says, would you like to put on film? The man says, no, no, thank you. I'm not religious. The boy says, you know, it's a very big mitzvah. <laughs> At a bar mitzvah, the first mitzvah you do is you put on tefillin. The man says, that's interesting, but I'm not religious. The boy says, it'll only take five minutes. The man says, no, I'm not religious. 
the boy says, you know, if you put on tefillin here, it helps Jews all over the world, including the soldiers in Israel. And this man is getting frustrated because they're not communicating. And he says again, I'm not religious. The boy, in the meantime, has rolled his sleeve up. <laughs> He's got the tefillin out. And he puts the tefillin on the man's arm and he says, say, say, Baruch. And the guy says, Baruch. Ata, ata. You know, I really shouldn't be doing this because I'm not religious. Anyway, they get the tefillin on. And more likely than not, the man starts to cry. It's an amazing experience. But let's examine exactly what happened there. Why did they not communicate? The man kept saying, I don't put on tefillin, I won't put on tefillin, and I shouldn't put on tefillin, because I'm not religious. That didn't register in the boy's mind at all. Simply went right over his head. And the reason is this. The man in the street is thinking, this young boy is obviously a religious child, a believer. And he put on tefillin this morning because, because he's religious. That makes sense. But then why doesn't he understand that I should not put on the tefillin because I am not religious? You see, it's so logical. And the boy dismisses his argument. Pays no attention. In the boy's mind, he's thinking, what is this guy babbling about? I asked him if he's Jewish. He said, yes. Well, so he should put on tefillin. The man keeps saying, I'm not religious. We're not talking about religion. I didn't ask you if you're religious. What has that got to do with anything? So he rolls up his sleeve and he puts the tefillin on him. Because in the morning, when the boy put on his tefillin, his own tefillin, it was not because he was religious. In fact, this boy doesn't consider himself religious. That's not part of his vocabulary. He put on tefillin in the morning because he's a Jewish boy. Jews put on tefillin. And that's why when he met the guy in the street, he asked him, are you Jewish? Because if you are, I have tefillin for you. Because tefillin and Jews are a good pair. <laughs> Jews put on tefillin, tefillin are worn by Jews. You see, it goes together. And the man says, but I'm not religious. And the boy is thinking, don't change the subject, honey. <laughs> We're not discussing religion here. So this is one of the things that the Rebbe introduced that revolutionized life for the Jew. When a Jew does a mitzvah, it has nothing to do with religion. A Jew does a mitzvah because it's a Jewish thing to do. And that's why the boy doesn't understand. If I put on tefillin because I'm a Jew, then you should put on tefillin because you just told me you're Jewish. No further questions. If you're a Jew, tefillin is for you. And the same with all mitzvahs. So the Rebbe said, I'm going to give you a principle by which to live. The principle is every Jew wants to do mitzvahs and be a better Jew. Don't take my word for it. Go out in the street. Stop a Jew, pick anyone you want. <laughs> this is a double blind test. Pick any Jew you want and ask him to put on film and see what happens. What happens? Millions and millions of Jews have put on film who are not religious. 
And when they put on the tefillin, it does something magical to them. So by this so often repeated experiment, we have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt the Rebbe is right. A Jew wants to be a better Jew. With very few exceptions. And those few exceptions is only because they're in a bad mood. I'll tell you a story I heard in Minnesota from an elderly Jew years ago. He was living in New York at the time. And he had an office in the Empire State Building. He came down for lunch one day and a young boy approached him and said, excuse me, are you Jewish? And he said, no, and walked away. The rest of the day, his conscience tortured him. Why did I say no? I am Jewish. How could I say no? How could I disavow my connection to my people? He couldn't sleep. The next day, he walked up and down the street looking for that boy with the truck, the tefillin tank, the tefillin truck. He didn't realize that the boys were there only on Fridays. Anyway, Friday came and he's walking down the street and he hears the music blaring from the truck and he runs after the truck. And another boy approaches him and says, are you Jewish? He says, yes, of course, I'm Jewish. The guy said, would you like to put on film? He says, yes. Would you like to take home a pushka for your house? It's a charity box. Yes. How about candles for your wife? to light? Yet he wouldn't say no again to anything. So we discovered that when you ask a Jew, are you Jewish? Even if he doesn't put on the tefillin, the question alone arouses such profound feelings for days. A person walks around thinking, why, why did he ask me that? Whose business is it that I'm Jewish? And yes, I'm Jewish. Well, I don't really go to temple, but I am Jewish. I don't keep any of the holidays, but yeah, I'm still Jewish. Then all of a sudden, maybe I should go to temple. Maybe I should do a few Jewish things, seeing how Jewish I am. That was the Rebbe's magic. Touch the soul of a Jew and watch what happens. So, just for a moment, let's consider this. Religion, in the common understanding of the word, in other words, for all practical purposes, putting aside, <clears throat> putting aside the, uh, the theology and the philosophy, when you get right down to it, religion means living a certain way in order to gain spiritual benefits. Whether it's to get to heaven, whether it's to be enlightened, whether it's to be saved from hell and purgatory, you live a certain way because you, you need to get certain benefits or primarily to get to heaven to assure a good life after life. That's religion. Judaism has never been a religion. Religions are those movements that kind of branched off from Judaism. But Judaism never called itself a religion. In fact, you don't find a word for religion or religious anywhere in the Torah. There's no word for it. There were mitzvahs to be done or, or to be ignored. But there was no religion. Heaven and hell are hardly mentioned in the entire Torah. 
we know about it from the Talmud and from the Zohar, but in the written Torah, it's hardly ever mentioned. So what then is Judaism? The difference between Judaism and religiosity, religiosity is the human being's attempt to make it to heaven. Judaism is God's desire to be invited down to earth, to bring heaven down to earth. And who, who has that desire? God. So instead of a human being trying to become more godly, Judaism is God trying to be more earthy. So what we do, every mitzvah we do, is to serve that purpose, to make the physical world more inviting to its creator. So that God could have this world as his primary domain. If you're doing for God, that's not really religion. Religion is when you ask God to do for you. So not long ago, I was speaking to a, a Christian minister, pastor. And he asks me very upfront, very, very bluntly, do you believe in the, in the Savior? I said, I'm really not looking for a God who's going to serve me and save me and take care of me. I want to serve God. And this man who has been a minister all his life started to cry. And he said, I never even thought of that. How could, how could I have missed that? To believe that God exists to serve your needs? That doesn't make sense. We are here to serve him. That's Judaism. But over the time, everybody calls their belief a religion, and we got schlepped into that. So that when somebody asks you, what is your religion? And you say, well, actually, I don't practice a religion. Uh, I'm, I'm practicing Judaism. And people walk away saying, okay, that's his religion. Didn't I? No, not really. It's not my religion. It's, it's Judaism. Okay, so that's what you believe. So that's your religion. We can't get rid of that word. We got stuck with it. But there is a huge difference. There's a huge difference between a human being trying to be the best human being. In other words, the created being trying to reach its creator versus the creator trying to join us on earth and depending on us to make earth receptive, to make the world receptive to his presence. Huge difference. One of the practical differences, if you're trying to get to heaven, if you're conscious, keenly aware that you're fragile and your life is not guaranteed and that your success to be able to put bread on the table is going to take a lot of work and effort and who knows if you'll succeed and protecting yourself from disease who knows whether you'll succeed and so you have to pray to god you have to depend on god you have to believe in god you have to get him on your side maybe he'll help you
But the result is you are needy. You're very needy, very dependent. On the other hand, if God asks us to prepare the world for him so that he could dwell on earth and be known and accepted by human beings, you're, you're not feeling needy. You're not carrying around the weight of all of those needs, all those dependencies. On the contrary, you are so inspired, you are so in awe of the fact that God asks you to serve him, you can actually do something for the creator. So that, it seems, is the Rebbe's view of freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. What are your choices? To be good or to be bad? What's the difference? So if you're good, you're good. If you're bad, you're bad. What's the difference? So you have to come up with an argument that says, if you be good, good things will happen to you. If you be bad, bad things will happen to you. It's all self-serving. And it's all fear-based. You don't want to suffer, do you? Well, then behave yourself. You want to get to heaven, right? Well, then do the right thing. It's almost like we are the center of the universe. God is here as a, as a personal valet to help me get to where I need to be. That's what religion has become. But the other way, I am not needy. If God gives me life, then I have life. If he takes it away, he takes it away. I'm not needy. Can't scare me. Don't threaten me with punishment. Tell me something wise and meaningful. Otherwise, leave me alone. So, recognizing that we are not here to struggle for a hundred years or ninety years just to keep us alive, and then you die. See, that doesn't make any sense. Life is a struggle, and then you die. So what was I struggling for? Doesn't add up. But if you say, I am here to serve God, then even if my life is 10 minutes long, and I served God for 10 minutes, I will forever be meaningful. I serve the Creator. Serving the Creator means doing something for Him. Not begging Him to be good to me. That's not serving. So the Rebbe raised an entire generation of enthusiastic, optimistic, joyful people. Why joyful? Well, if it's not about me and I'm not needy, then what have I got to be sad about? And what have I got to be happy about? The Creator needs me. What I do matters to Him. I illustrate this with a little story. There's this little girl in Israel, 12 years old. She got it into her head that God was angry at her. And she was miserable. They took her to psychiatrists, they took her to Kabbalists, they took her to everyone they could think of, and no one could dissuade her. So the father calls me, from Israel, I never met him. And he says, can you help me with my daughter? And without asking me, he puts his daughter on the phone. 
what do you, what do you say to a 12 year old who you never met doesn't know you you don't know her it was very awkward so i said god is angry at you she says yeah i said i'm so jealous she says what i said i'm so jealous you're 12 years old and you can get god angry how, how did you become so important her problem went away everyone who spoke to her tried to convince her that god was not angry at her but she was convinced that god is angry at her by examining what does it mean god is angry at you what does that mean that you're in trouble no it means you must be really significant at 12 years old you can get the master of the universe angry wow so now it turns out that she may be right god is angry at her but if god is angry at you it is the greatest compliment in the world Well, almost the greatest compliment. The really great compliment is that when you do a mitzvah, God is thrilled with you. How did you become so important? I don't know, and I'm not going to ask. But if God finds me that significant, I'm fine with that. I'm not complaining. So what I do matters to the Creator which means what I do matters to the universe. Now, all of a sudden, I am unburdened because I have no needs. I'm not the needy one. And on the other hand, I'm so complimented and so enthused by this thought that everything I do can change the world and make God happy or angry. I'm no lightweight anymore. Now I got to take my behavior seriously, even my thoughts. This is what the Rebbe introduced to the world. We are here to serve the Creator, not the other way around. And why is that? Because the Creator does not exist to serve us and we don't have all those needs we think we have. So a young boy writes to the Rebbe, I was misbehaving, I did something really, really bad and unkosher, and I'm feeling really guilty, but I can't stop. What can I tell myself to stop sinning? Seems the boy tried every argument, nothing worked. The Rebbe said to him, consider that when you do a mitzvah and you bring a little godliness into the world, it makes it easier for every kid your age all over the world to do more mitzvahs. Because you've added that flavor to the world and the whole world is now more inclined towards holiness when you sin you make it harder for every kid your age all over the world to refuse to sin because you've added unholiness to the world and now it's harder to be holy for everyone so what was the Rebbe telling him the Rebbe was saying <clears throat> No individual is a private citizen. It's a mistaken perception of life. What I do by myself in the privacy of my home, it's nobody else's business. I'm not bothering anybody. The Rebbe says, yes, you are. We're living in a tiny little world, a closed system. 
if you pollute the air one side of the other world, it affects the other side of the world. If you pollute the ocean where you live, the ocean is polluted for everyone who lives on the ocean. And the same is true with holiness and unholiness. You create unholiness in your house, the whole world has become less holy. You do a mitzvah in your house, and the whole world has become holier. So for this boy, that was all he needed to hear. His behavior was suddenly much more significant. There was such a noble reason not to sin. Because without that, the only reason not to sin is because you're going to get yourself in trouble. Not very noble. Take good care of yourself and don't uh, do anything stupid. Okay, that's not noble. But if you consider the rest of the world, the people beyond yourself, and act according to what is best for everyone, that's noble. If someone were to ask, what are the mitzvahs? God gives us mitzvahs, keep kosher, separate meat and milk, don't work on Shabbos, light a Shabbos candle, give charity. What are all these things? The question is, these are commandments coming from God. And God says, honor your mother and father. Yeah, I guess I should come to think of it. I really should. I should honor my mother and father. It's a great idea. It's good for civilization. It's good for my character, for my personality. To be grateful to your parents for what they did, that makes you a real mensch. So yes, I should, I should. But then I think again and I say, wait a minute. Why is it God's concern that I should honor my parents? Honoring my parents is for my own benefit. I'll do it with or without God. I'm not that dense that it would never occur to me to honor my parents. In fact, my parents remind me every day. And I'm supposed to honor them. So why is it God's commandment that I honor them? In other words, every commandment God gives me, what's in it for him? Nothing. So they're not really his commandments. They're just good suggestions for how to make my life better. But then I don't understand. If it's a suggestion for my benefit, what's wrong with my refusing? No thanks. I appreciate the concern, but no thanks. No, that's not acceptable. So one second. If it's all for my benefit and it's just advice on how to live best, what do you mean I can't say no? Why shouldn't I be able to say no? And even more puzzling, why do Jews die rather than violate a commandment? That doesn't make any sense. The commandment is there to enhance my life. Why am I giving up my life to enhance the mitzvah? So we must come to the conclusion. If God is giving us the commandment, then obviously it's important to him for his benefit. By including us, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate compliment, that although God keeps Shabbos because he created the world in six days 
and he rested on the seventh, he includes us in his Shabbos. But it's his Shabbos. So why does he ask us to observe Shabbos? Because he's sitting there observing Shabbos, he would like us to join him. He basically wants us to be on the same page with him. Like in a good marriage. So when God is fixing the world for the six days of the week, then we should also fix the world. Do all sorts of labors to improve living conditions. Build a house, plow the field, sew a dress, cook a meal, whatever it is, make, make the world more friendly, user friendly. But that's because God is doing it, so you join him. When God rests, he asks you to join him in his rest. So what are the mitzvahs? The mitzvahs tell us what God is up to and invites us to stay in touch and in step with him. So when he's putting on film, we should put on film. When he is resting on Shabbos, we should rest pretty much. When he is creating, when he is being holy, we should be holy. When he is giving out charity, we should give out charity. So the mitzvah is God's mitzvah. These are things that work for him. An interesting example for us. We have time, right? Anybody in a hurry? We're good. <laughs> yeah, we're good? We're good. A group of women from the 60s, the hippie time, told me that they're organizing a minion. They're going to be davening 10 women together. And they're, they're asking for advice on how to make it work. The problem was that they get together and some can read Hebrew fluently, some hesitantly, and some don't read Hebrew at all. What are they going to do? Also, what does it mean to say, to say the same prayer every day or every week? And thirdly, whose prayer is this? Somebody else wrote a, a, a text for prayer and you read somebody else's words? That's called praying? What is that? So concerning that last question, I said to them, I'm surprised that women would ask such a question. And they said, what does it have to do with being women? I said, you know, every woman, every wife asks her husband, how come you don't say I love you? And every husband says, you, you know I love you. And the wife says, yes, but why can't you say it? And the husband says, well, if you know I love you, why do I have to say it? She says, I like to hear you say it. And the husband says, if you know I love you, then I don't need to say it. Grow up. And she says, would it kill you to say I love you? And he says, if I say it, will you be happy? You'll leave me alone? <laughs> she says, yes. He says, fine, I love you, okay? Can we talk about something else now? Would we do the same thing with God? God says, you know, you haven't said Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekein, Hashem Achad. You haven't said Shema to me in a long time. I like to hear you say Shema, God is one. And we say to God, you know you're one. You've always been one. God said, I know, I know, but I like to hear you say it. He said, well, if you know you're one, why do I have to say it? Grow up. And God says, would it kill you to say Shema Yisrael? 
So we say, okay, fine. We go to shul, we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Can we go now? <laughs> if a wife says, why don't you say I love you? And the husband says, why don't I say it? Because I don't need to say it. I love you, you know I love you, I don't need to say it. The wife says, but I'd love, to, but I would like to hear you say it. He says, why? Grow up. Should a husband say, I love you? Absolutely. But why should he say it if it doesn't mean anything to him? It doesn't work for him. It doesn't excite him. He loves her. That's exciting. Saying I love you doesn't do anything for him. Should he do it anyway? Like a hypocrite? Yes, he should. And it's not hypocrisy. Sometimes you give voice to what you're feeling. Expresses you. Sometimes you say the words that work for someone else, even though it doesn't work for you. Knowing that your wife loves hearing it, that's a very good reason to say it. In fact, it's the best reason. You say, I love you only when you're in the mood? Hmm. Not so nice. So why do we daven? Why do we pray? Why do we go to shul? Because God wants to hear from us. Not that I need it. He needs it. Is that reason enough to do it? It's the best reason. The best. So when a person says, you know, I go to shul every day, I daven, doesn't mean anything to me. It's perfect. Perfect. Don't mess it up. Don't become an expert davener, because then you're not talking to God anymore. Now you're doing your own thing. By doing all of this, we are literally making God real in the world. We're giving God his kind of world. We're responding to his need, not to ours. We're not trying to hire God to take care of us. That makes us more real and him less real. But if we're conducting our lives, going about our business in the awareness that this is God's world and he's the one who needs stuff to happen and these commandments, this is him. This is God describing himself, but inviting us to join him in those things because he'd rather do it with us than without us. That's a whole new world. Imagine if tomorrow morning, everybody wakes, everyone in the world wakes up and says, so what does God need of me today? Would we have peace in the world? Yeah. Without negotiations without signed treaties, we would have peace because everybody is busy serving God. So if everybody wakes up and what can I do for God today? That's it. There are no more wars. There's no more nastiness. There's no more arrogance, which is the root of all evil. So this is the Rebbe's view of the future. We are promised that before Mashiach comes, there will be wisdom enough in the world to unite all human beings into a common effort. What common effort? Make the world inviting to its creator.
everybody, without any exceptions. Every human being is in charge of a little piece of the world. And in that little piece of the world, is God comfortable or uncomfortable? Is God welcome or unwelcome? That's up to every individual. So if each of us makes our little world receptive and appropriate for God, then God has his home in the lowest world and he can join us rather than take us to heaven to join him. So on the Rebbe's yard site, time for reflection, a time for examination to see how we're doing, progress report. It should inspire us that that vision is so beautiful, it's so dignified, so complementary of the human being. We're not a bunch of needy ants running around trying to get a favor from God. And then we compete, you know, who's going to get a bigger favor and who does God love more? My God can beat up your God and that's foolish stuff like that. It gets us way past that. So we should, we should each find a way, a way that we haven't yet used or taken advantage of. Find a way of introducing a little more godliness a little more goodness, a little more holiness into the world. Because what you do on this side of the globe affects the other side of the globe. So with no arrogance at all, we accept the fact that any any one of us can change the world single-handedly. Because if you tip the scales one way or another, you've changed the outcome. What does it take to, to tip the scales? Well, we have 3,333 years worth of mitzvahs on one side of the scale. We have the world's sins on the other side of the scale. And it's evenly balanced. The next thing you do will tilt the scale either in favor of the mitzvahs or in favor of the sins. The world hangs in the balance all the time. So we should never underestimate a little mitzvah. Because a little mitzvah on top of all the other mitzvahs can tilt the scale. Now, in view of the corona thing, sad to say, there were people, rabbis among them, who were quick to explain that it's our sins that is causing the virus. We're being punished for our sins. And, and they, they each come up with another sin that we're guilty of, that is bringing all of this wrath of God. So the synagogues are closed, there's no minion, because God doesn't, doesn't want to hear from you anymore. He can't tolerate you. And he's saying, stay home, stay in your room, you're being grounded. I don't want to hear from you. That is really, really, really distasteful. How can you possibly think like that? See, this is, this is a problem when religion becomes a habit and you're not even thinking anymore. If we were thinking, if we would just look at reality, 
When did God ask us to be his people, to keep his commandments? 3,333 years ago at Mount Sinai. That was the first time God spoke to a group of people. Before that, it was always with an individual. God spoke to Adam, God spoke to Noah, God spoke to Abraham, God spoke to Isaac. For the first time in all of history, God spoke to a people. The Jewish people were camped at the foot of the mountain and God spoke to them. That was the first time and it was also the last time. God hasn't spoken to us since then. 3,333 years of silence. It's actually a great compliment, you know. God told us what he needs us to do, and he doesn't feel any need to repeat himself. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, he sent, he sent prophets with messages. He sent sages with advice, but we never heard from him. In 3,333 years. So if after all of that time, there's a Jew anywhere in the world who uh, kind of forgot certain mitzvahs, can you imagine God being angry at him? God is angry at a Jew today because 3,000 years ago, some ancestor that we don't know promised to do the mitzvahs. That's why God is angry at us today, 3,333 years later. It's so unreasonable. But to make it infinitely worse, the last 2,000 of the 3,000 years have been horrible. An exile that was unthinkable. We survive only by miracle because it was so bad. So 3,000 years of no conversation and 2,000 years of horrors. The Crusades, the Inquisitions, the pogroms, the, the ghettos, the blood libels, and then the Holocaust. And after all of that, if a Jew doesn't know how to do a mitzvah or doesn't know that he should do the mitzvah, God is angry at the Jew? What kind of thinking is this? What do you take God to be? An anti-Semite? It is simply not thinkable, it's not possible that God is disappointed with his people. It's not possible. We are still Jews after 3,000 years of not hearing from him and 2,000 years of really good reasons to quit. We didn't quit. We're not quitting. We want to be better Jews. How can God be angry with us? How can he not be thrilled? So let's try this. During, during the Pesach of this year, there was a man who lives alone his wife passed away. They have no children. He's literally alone, locked down, isolated in his apartment. The eve of Pesach, Seder night, he remembered that it was Pesach. He had completely ignored it and forgotten. And he hadn't even bought any matzah. He felt bad. So he went looking in his pantry and he found rice cakes. No matzah. 
rice cakes. And he thought, you know, they're round like the matzah. From a distance, the surface kind of looks like matzah texture. So he took three rice cakes and four cups of wine and he sat down to make a Seder to the best of his knowledge because he had never made a Seder before. So he was just following the instructions in his little Haggadah. When he called me after Yontif, he wanted to tell me that he had expected his own Seder to be pathetic, sad, meaningless, because he doesn't even know how to do it right. And he was pleasantly surprised that for, somehow, for some reason, while he was doing the Seder, it felt significant. It felt to him like it was being appreciated. An amazing little story. So if you were extremely religious, what would your reaction to this story be? A guy makes a Seder on, on rice cakes because he forgot that it was Pesach and he didn't even bother buying matzah. What would you think of that? If you were ultra-Orthodox, ultra-religious, you would say that was horrible made a mockery of the whole thing. He didn't fulfill any mitzvah by eating rice cakes on, on Pesach. He shouldn't have done it. Better, he should just mind his own business and don't, don't mess with things you don't know. If you were a secular person, what would your reaction be to the story? Your reaction would be, Man's wasting his time. You don't have matzah. You're not that observant. You even forgot that it's Pesach. Let it go. What are you doing? Making a Seder out of desperation? I'm not desperate. Shouldn't even have bothered. If you want to make a Seder next year, and you'll remember, you'll make a Seder next year, but don't bother with this rice cakes business. What would the Rebbe say? What would the Baal Shem Tov say? This man made a Seder? He felt compelled to make a Seder? Why? There was no one there. He was all by himself. No peer pressure. No rabbinic pressure. If he hadn't made the Seder, nobody would ever complain. Nobody would even know. And if he does make the Seder, no one is going to compliment you. No one is going to give you credit for this. Why did he do it? And did he fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah on Pesach? No, no, he didn't. So was his Seder a halachically correct Seder? No, no, it wasn't. But what would the Rebbe say about that? The Rebbe would say, this man's Seder, more than most people's Seder, brought God to tears. The devotion, the sincerity, the, the caring, it's Pesach night, I'm Jewish. What am I going to let it go by without a Seder? So I'm willing to embarrass myself and make a clumsy Seder with three rice cakes, which is kind of funny. But it's Pesach. got to make a Seder. And why do I got to make a Seder? Nobody's watching. Nobody's, nobody's going to criticize and nobody's going to applaud but I'm Jewish 
A Jew makes a Seder. So I'll make it. Bring God to tears. That's the Rebbe's view. The view according to God. So can God be angry with us? you got to be kidding. God is absolutely tickled pink. I don't know what that means, but it's an expression. Uh, we turned out to be more than he expected. Any Jew today who simply says, I'm a Jew, is a hero. That unbreakable bond, that eternal devotion and commitment after 2,000 years of misery and 3,000 years of neglect, and Jews are still Jews? Come on. So I heard this beautiful story. I, I don't know if it needs repeating or not, but I think it's a great story. Vladimir Putin recently asked a rabbi, how is it that other cultures, other nations, bigger and stronger than the Jews, has faded away, gone, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and the Jew is still here. What's the secret? The rabbi was a little uncomfortable with the question. He was afraid to answer. Would he come across too arrogant? Would, it, would he be insulted? It was, it was too risky. So he said to Putin, do you have a theory on this? What do you say? Listen to what Putin said. He said, I've been thinking a lot about it, and I've come to the conclusion that the other nations all relied on things that were temporary. Money, army, weapons, politics, all temporary. But the Jews rely on things that are permanent. The Jews rely on the Torah, on the rabbis, and on family. Those are eternal, and the people are eternal. What an amazing observation. From an objective observer. Family. If you're loyal to your family, if you believe in family, if you stick with the family, you're pretty much indestructible. One generation brings another, and you go on and on and on. The rabbis, the wisdom of our sages, the wisdom of our teachings, form a well traveled path that is the way of life. Not a way of life, the way of life. This is life as it should be. So if you stick to that, you will not be destroyed. And you will not become extinct by neglect. And the Torah the sanctity of the Torah, the absolute truth of the Torah, that's the foundation. That's something you can build a beautiful structure on and it'll stand firm. But it's a good foundation. Torah is Torah. It's, it doesn't even need a compliment. Torah is God's record of his relationship with his people and the listing and the instructions as to what he needs from his people. That is never changing. So 
So if you're devoted to these three things, according to Professor Putin, Rabbi Putin, if you're devoted to those things, you will exist forever. Because those things are forever. Quite, quite an interesting insight. Sounded as good as any sermon I've ever heard. And that's encouraging because if a, if a man like Putin is already quoting Jewish philosophy and Jewish thought, that's a pretty good sign for the future. And yes, I know, he was the head of the KGB. I'm not saying he's a tzaddik. I'm saying that he couldn't resist but praise the Jews and let his people know that the Jews have something worth learning. So what about the corona? If it's not a punishment, what is it? And it's definitely not a punishment. So there was this cartoon online. The cartoon showed the devil speaking with God. And the devil says, so I shut down all your synagogues. How do you like that? And God says, you didn't shut down synagogues. I moved synagogues into every Jewish home. I turned every Jewish home into a synagogue. By being isolated, quarantined, Judaism was practiced for the last three months at home, not in shul. So God is telling us something very clearly. You may have gotten into the impression that Judaism is a community affair, that Judaism is practiced in public, in a synagogue, with a huge membership. Nope, gotta remind you, Judaism is personal between the individual and his God or her God. So stay home, don't, don't do minion stuff. Do your own prayer. It may not be perfect, but it is precious brings God to tears. I mean, what must God be thinking? I haven't spoken to them in 3,300 years. I have put them through the most unimaginable horrors for the last 2,000 years. And what do they want? They just want to be better Jews. Can't get over that. What are these people made of? It's true. Jews are an incredible people. Not like any other nation. And the world knows it. They just don't know how to handle it. So some people say to the Jews, you're such a heavenly people. You're God's chosen. You're God's children. So why don't you go to heaven? What are you doing here? The rest of them say the opposite. Go somewhere else. But everybody thinks we should go somewhere and not stay here. I don't know which one is more dangerous. The ones who think I should, that we should all go down or the ones who think we should all go up. What they have in common is that we don't belong here. So we got to fix that first. Of course, we belong here. One final story. There was a man who was a very proud patriot, American, very proud of his country. He made a trip to Washington. 
And he just loved taking in all the sites, the monuments and the buildings. And he was just bursting with pride until he noticed that not far from the White House, there is a building that doesn't really fit in. It's not American architecture. He heard the people inside are singing songs and they're not American songs. Seems they were celebrating a holiday and it wasn't an American holiday. And they were wearing clothes, but not American clothes. So he gets very upset and he knocks on the door. Guy comes to the door and he rants and raves at him. And he says, how long have you been living in the United States? The man says about 20 years. He says, for 20 years, you have enjoyed the hospitality and all the benefits of life in the United States. And you don't have the decency to dress like an American, to sing American songs, to celebrate American holidays, to build American style homes. The man said, uh, excuse me, but this is the Norwegian embassy. We are here to show Americans how we live back in, in Norway. If I ate your food, sang your songs, wore your clothes and celebrated your holidays, I would lose my job. My job is to show you how we do it back in Norway. This is our embassy. So of course the man had to apologize. Every Jewish home should be an embassy. We are here to show the world how God wants it done. If we dress like everybody else and celebrate the same holidays and eat their same foods and sing their songs, we're, we're, we're out of a job. So we're not private citizens. The Rebbe taught us that. You're not a private citizen. You're an embassy. You're there for people to look up to, to use as a role model. So should, Jew, should Jews dress differently? Yeah, I, of course. Should we, should we be visibly Jewish? Absolutely. We're an embassy and we represent God and we have to represent him well. By and large, we do. But it can use some improvement. So, be a proud Jew, and you will be a chassid of the Rebbe. Think about other Jews, not just yourself. You will become a chassid of the Rebbe. And be optimistic about the future. There will be more Judaism, not less. More mitzvahs, not less. More morality, not less. If you think like that, you're the Rebbe's chassid. And that is a huge privilege.